Our guest in this segment is Seth DiStefano from the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. Good morning, Seth. How are you? Good, Rob. How you doing? Excellent. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to you. Missed you on that one. And if I don't see you before Christmas, Merry Christmas to you, Seth. Thank you so much. How are things at the center these days? I think we're doing pretty well. Yeah. That's good to hear. Kelly, Kelly's doing good? Kelly is doing well. The whole team's doing well. Um, you know, no shortage of, of you know, accountability and, and busy work um, heading into um, the legislative session, which will begin in February. That's right. right. So we, we do get an extra month to prepare um, as it is a gubernatorial election year. Before um, we are... Yeah, well, I'll finish your sentence. I'm sorry, Seth. No, no, it was just, it was just pointing out that, you know, th th this is one of those years where the session starts the second Wednesday in February as opposed to the second Wednesday in January. Before we get into our subject matter on the day, I want to ask you about uh, your thoughts on uh, a new incoming Governor Morrissey. Obviously, the Republicans also uh, further solidified their supermajority in the House uh, and the Senate. So your thoughts there? Um, I mean, I, I, I didn't see any major surprises on Election Day when it came to West Virginia, is what I'll say. Um, and my attitude um, as you know, the person who spends the most time at the Capitol on behalf of my organization is that it's really my job to work with the people that the voters send to Charleston. So um, that's, that's kind of how I look at it, and um, I'm eager to do so um, come, come February. What is the mission of the center? So we um, look out for people that traditionally don't get a, a seat at the table, really. So, like, our, our mission um, is to look out for um, communities that are lower income um, and communities that, um, you know, oftentimes um, see benefit um, in public institutions, things like public education, like we're going to talk about today, um, and, and to protect and to fight for equitable access um, to those things. Um, for folks that traditionally um, don't don't always get a seat um, at the decision making table in Charleston, I'm kind of bringing this around full circle here a little bit, and this is the next bridge point here, Seth. Uh, I promise we're going to get there. But we yesterday spoke with House Majority Leader Eric Householder about the state's numbers in regards to the monthly reports for the revenues, and uh, November. Uh, numbers are, are in now, and I, I think the state is averaging about a million a month in surplus dollars, but with some bills coming due, and that includes Hope Scholarship bills as uh, this continues to expand. And here's how we kind of bring this full circle here, Seth. Your thoughts on how these revenue numbers, which are right now pretty much meeting, but not really exceeding projections, and how those revenue numbers will balance with the increased numbers that will have to be spent on tax cuts and the HOPE scholarship? Well, I mean, the numbers don't add up, I guess you could say, just for you know the 30,000-foot view. I think it's important, um, and I'm glad you brought this up, um, to point out that you know these quote-unquote revenue estimates, um, they can be done accurately. Um, and I just, you know, it, it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that um, the revenue estimates that we've been dealing with for the previous five or six years um, have been set so artificially low um, as to make it look like there were significant surpluses um, and using that as a catalyst to cut taxes when we really should not have done that. Um, what we're looking at now, um, Rob, in, in a lot of areas, um, is increased base budget spending priorities that have been passed by this legislature and signed in to law by the governor with dwindling money to actually pay for it. That's, that's the long short of it. The Hope Scholarship, if it is allowed to continue to expand, um, is going to represent a very significant um, problem for lawmakers when they come back in. Um, the Hope Scholarship affects our financial. Uh, also, they affect public schools, and that is traditional public schools, so to speak. What has your research shown you in terms of the effect on enrollment in public schools as the Hope Scholarship becomes more popular? I mean, I think that you see it um, in, in the news every day all over West Virginia. Um, what you're seeing um, is the very painful decisions that county boards of education are having to make um, with, you know, essentially a, a voucher system um, that incentivizes families to pull their kids out of public schools. Um, public school funding, Rob, in, in, in West Virginia is heavily tied to enrollment. Um, and so as um, these, these families are incentivized to pull their kids out of public schools through these vouchers, um, funding decreases significantly, and we're seeing um, 
the uh, the consequences of that all over the state in, in school closures and consolidations. Right here in Kanawha County, I think it's six schools um, they just voted to close. Um, they're going to build a, a, you know, an elementary school, I believe, in the eastern part of the county um, that's upwards of uh, maybe 600 students are going to are going to end up going to that school. I mean, that's there are real consequences um, for for children, for their education and for their prospects in life um, when you do these things. And I really haven't seen, you know, from 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 my looking at things, I don't really see these vouchers really doing much of anything except for people who could already afford private school tuition in the first place, which I think is a real shame. Bill? Yeah, good morning, Seth. Uh, reading your read ahead, there's a couple of statements that I'm confused about. Let me read you one of them quickly and short. Eight counties, including Berkeley County, Montegala County, Pocahontas County, Ohio, and others, experienced enrollment decline attributable to the HOPE Scholarship greater than 100% meaning that if not for the HOPE Scholarship, the district would not have had negative enrollment decline and lost state funding. The most significant decline was observed in Berkeley County with 1,244% of the decline attributable to the HOPE Scholarship. I did not realize we were losing students in Berkeley County. Yes. Um, that is based off of, um, that's from Kelly's report, um, which I believe is based off of the um, the first year, um, if I'm not mistaken, of the, um, the 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 Hope Scholarship, and we are waiting for more data um, from the from the Treasurer's Department, um, hopefully very soon, about what what years two and three um, have have done to specific counties. But more to your point. Yeah, before um, before we go much farther, uh, that runs counter to what we're experiencing on on the ground where we're just bursting at the seams. We're having to use modulars to, uh, uh, to house the students. We're not seeing a decline. I'm not sure what report would even hint at that, but that runs counter to what we're actually seeing, Seth. Yeah, well, and again, um, I think Berkeley County's growth in general, because it's one of the only places in West Virginia that is experiencing growth, might kind of paper over um, some of the consequences um, that, that other school systems are seeing just in general. Um, we'll know more. Again, what, 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 what you're quoting there, what I, I believe was from the, the first year of the Hope Scholarship. It, it may have been, um, it may have been so, but you said Berkeley County kind of coats over, but, but you're using Berkeley County or the reports using Berkeley County as the poster child, if you will. We are the no, ones I, observing the I, most I, significant decline. So uh, you cannot have it both ways. No, I'm not, I don't think I said that, to be honest with you. Bill. I'm looking at the report. Um, what, I'm looking at the report. What, what we're pointing out is that if not for the losses to the attributable, attributable to the Hope Scholarship in that year, Berkeley County would have seen more resources for their public schools. Um, that's, that's, that's really what that, that data point that you're quoting there, that there were counties that had it not been for the losses attributable to these vouchers, um, those counties would have seen increased resources because they would have seen increased enrollment um, overall through the K through 12 public schools. That's 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 the the, the point of that particular data point. Well, I'm I'm reading again. I do not see anything dealing with uh, resources coming in. Uh, it's pretty uh, the the verbiage is pretty is restricted to that of enrollment, so and not not resources. So, Seth, two two points. Um, from uh, Board of Education members in Berkeley County who are um, who are responding online, one says the the numbers are actually we've lost 200 students this year, um, and then another board member says, "Do you track how many leave and then how many come back? Does that have any impact on um, on the reporting that you all are doing?" Um, I. I don't want to speak for um, my policy analysts who are kind of awaiting new information on the specific number of kids that leave and come back. But we have heard um, just and I hate to say the word anecdotally, but we have talked with folks about that kind of being an issue, especially um, considering that um, we do know that 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 hope that these vouchers are also supporting non accredited schools. And to your point, um, one of the things that, that, that is happening out there is that parents will pull their kids from the public school system 
they'll enroll them in a private school thinking that their 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 kid is going to get a, a an, you know an accredited education at that school and they don't find out until later um that that's not the case right and so they end up putting their kids back into the public school system um I, again i don't have the exact numbers um as to you know what is happening or how often that happens um, but we have heard of it happening um to, to your point there well and, and there's that, there's certainly no question i'm sorry to interrupt there's no question that there's been a proliferation of private schools christian schools um expanding um specifically in berkeley county um so that clearly has some impact as well correct absolutely yes it does and i think that you um you know if i can segue into a, another point another problem with these vouchers is that there's really not any accountability to them right so the public school system is is accountable to the public right you can look up the results for muscle Run or spring mills or you know any myriad of, of public institutions and public schools k-12 in your county and you can see how they do right um, that's not really the case with private schools or micro schools or, or um, home schools in general. We don't really know what, you know, these kids, um, you know, what, h how they're performing, right? And I think that is a significant um, lack of a guardrail um, when it comes to the education of, of kids, um, not just in Berkeley County, but everywhere um, where these vouchers are, 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 are taking up bigger and, and, and more, more space within the public school budget. I want to point out something that the uh, president of the Board of Education, Jackie Long, just made on our comment section. Many students come back, as you know, but after October, the funding doesn't follow them. So that means if you enrolled in a private school, but you wait until November to transfer back to the public schools, the public school does not get that share of the state dollars that went to the private school or the charter school or wherever the kid went to school. Uh, and that's, that's that means that the school then is educating the child for the remainder of the year without a fraction of the money that the school lost for the child initially enrolling somewhere else. And maybe that's something that can be addressed or fixed as this program moves along, because uh, I was not aware of that, Jackie, pointing that out right now. Um, and that's a great point, too, because in, in these particular instances, um, those kids oftentimes will need, they'll need extra attention, right? Because if they got pulled out, you know, if, if their parents decided to send them to, you know, something in a, in an education alternative that is, you know, approved through these vouchers, and then maybe they find out that their kid just isn't getting the education that they wanted or the education that they need, they pull them out and they put them back into um, public schools, that kid has lost, you know, several months of instruction. Right. And then they, you know, then the, the, the teachers and the staff at the public school, not only do they lose the resources, right, the, the, the resources don't come back to the public school to, to take care of those kids. Um, oftentimes they have to spend extra time um, getting them caught up. Right. And that has impact, um, you know, for, for a whole classroom. Seth uh, DeStefano is our guest. He is the Policy Outreach Director for the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. Seth, you mentioned school closings around the state and consolidations, and certainly that was going on, and uh, I think at a pretty good clip, before the HOPE Scholarship Program was instituted. What evidence do you have that there is a direct correlation between the HOPE Scholarship Program now and school closings and consolidations around the state? I mean, I think that, you know, there are, you know, it, it is it is a 100% fact that we've been losing population just generally over the last 10 years, if you will, right? Um, but what we have not had, Rob, um, is until a couple years ago was a, a an incentive, essentially a, a cash incentive to pull your kids out of the public school system, um, thereby leading to fewer and fewer resources. Um, I think that you know, members of the State Board of Education and multiple county boards of education have come out and said it very plainly. And when it comes to the correlation between, you know, the Hope Scholarship being a contributing factor, right, it, it is a contributing factor to these closures. To me, it's just common sense. When you have a, a voucher um, style system that incentivizes parents to pull their kids out of public school um, and you have um, a, a school funding formula that is heavily dependent on enrollment, um, it just, it, you know, it, it, it only makes sense um, that a lot of schools, especially your smaller community schools, um, are going to end up on the chopping block. 
Yeah, Seth. I mean, I think Kanawha County, Kanawha County, I think they said, I believe it was quoted as they've lost like 1,200 kids in total over the last three years, and they, they've closed like six schools. I mean, it's, it's pretty heartbreaking when you, you know, where I come from in, in, in Randolph County, they're talking about putting kids on buses from Harmon to Elkins and Pickens to Mill Creek every day. I mean, this is, it's bananas. I mean, what they're, you know, you're going to have kids on, you're going to have kids getting up at, at five in the morning to get ready to ca- catch the bus to school. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's something's got to give. Uh, Seth, you uh, uh, you used the word voucher program a second ago. Uh, Looking at some of your data uh, in Arizona, the voucher in one school, one area, one state rather, uh, voucher program increased from ten thousand to eighty thousand uh, in eight years' time. Uh, the question is voucher and i've heard a lot of folks with the hope scholarship say it is not a voucher program why are you saying the hope scholarship is a voucher program um i mean i think that it it you know it has more or less all the um you know all the attributes of a voucher style program similar to what um you you would see in arizona where they're having incredible budget problems um, because of an unrestricted enrollment. An unrestricted enrollment, I might add, Bill, um, that I believe 2026 um, is, is when our own voucher-style Hope Scholarship program is, is set to just completely, you know, blow up, um, to just, com- you know, no, no, no enrollment caps, no nothing. So, um, you know, I don't know if that really does the best to answer your question, um, but it's essentially what it, you know, the reason I call it a voucher is because it just basically takes that 5000 or so dollars um, away from the public school system once your, your kid leaves public school currently um, and, and give that to the parents to either pay for private school tuition or other, you know, um, you know, uh, education alternatives, if you will, outside of the K-12 through system. You've probably heard Riley Moore and others argue that it is not a voucher program. How would you counter their, their particular arguments? I would not get bogged down in semantics, to be honest with you. Um, I think that, you know, the relative fact of the matter is is that what we have in West Virginia now that is actively hurting communities um, is a system um, that is that is designed to incentivize parents to pull their kids out of the K through 12 public education system um, and put those dollars towards private schools um, or other education options that have pretty much no accountability, right? And in doing so, um, it is creating serious harm in a lot of communities all over the state. So, Seth, do you see this new administration coming in and doing anything to blow things up? I mean, I read a, a column by uh, Stephen, Adam, Stephen Allen Adams the other day talking about, and this is something that's been out there forever, that you have 55 boards of education, 55 county superintendents, 55 um, uh, board offices, and is that something that needs to be changed um, right now? So, I mean, I, I would not, um, I would encourage folks not to be distracted by, you know, putting the blame on county boards of education. I really don't think that's fair. Um, and I think that a lot of county boards have taken um, a very unfair share of heat for the decisions that they've had to make with the dwindling money they have to work with. I think the pressure needs to be on, and just my personal opinion here, needs to be on state lawmakers and the new governor when they come in in February. They are the ones that have the control over the school aid funding formula. They are the ones that can roll this back, right? The first step in making sure public schools have the resources they need is not allowing um, public dollars to go to private schools. I don't know, you know, that just you're, you're never going to have a, a funding formula that's fair and equitable as long as you're pushing those dollars um, to really to private schools in any way. Um, I think um, that tinkering around the edges and this idea of, well, a centralized, you know, system where you have, I don't know, maybe a dozen, you know, regional boards versus 55, I, I don't think that's going to work, to be honest with you. Um, I think that that's more, um, number one, I, I don't think it's going to work politically. I don't think the voters are going to put up with, you know, losing their county board of education um, in in support of, you know, a maybe a you know a seven or eight regional county board i don't i don't see that happening and i also just don't see it um really addressing the root of the problem by the way a program note uh, coming up after the nine o'clock 
uh, segment begins. Dr. Ryan Sachs, superintendent of schools in Berkeley County, will be our guest today. So we will be following up with him uh, more about the discussion we've had with Seth so far this morning. Seth, I only have about a minute and a half left. You mentioned Randolph County and uh, kids will have to be bused further along the route to school and such. Are there no opportunities for private schools or smaller private type schools to be developed in Randolph County around these kids so they don't have to continue to go a far distance, uh, great distances to the public schools? I just, I don't accept that as a, as a substitute, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I don't know that anyone is going to be interested in setting up a private or charter school in Harmon, West Virginia, or, or Pickens, to be honest with you, um, because it's a, it's a much smaller community. Um, you know, private schools are heavily concentrated in West Virginia and only a handful of counties, right? Um, there's a reason for that because there's only really a handful of counties that have the population to support them in the first place. Um, you know, what I, I think would be best and in the interest of everyone um, is to support our community schools. Um, you know, K-12 through education, you know, our, our teachers, our bus drivers, our, you know, school aides and cooks, they do a tremendous job. Um, we should not be taking resources away from them. We need to make sure that they have everything they need um, to support, you know, the workforce and, you know, the, the leaders of tomorrow. That's, 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 where we, that's where we come down on it. Well, I'm out of time. Thank you so much for yours, Seth. Appreciate the conversation. Thanks, Seth. Thank you. Great talking. Seth DeStefano, Policy Outreach Director for the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy there. Time for the break.